Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar about what's in store for EE4J, MicroProfile, and Pyara Micro. So, uh, my name is Dominika Tasas. I am a head of marketing and community building at Pyara, and I'm here today with our two speakers and presenters, um, Steve Millich, Pyara founder and technical director, and Mike Croft, Pyara head of support who in the next half an hour or so uh, will give you an update on the key topics. So let's see the agenda. Yeah, um, so basically the first one will start with Pyra Server 4 to 5 switch over uh, with Steve Milic. Um, this is especially important for those of you who are already using Pyra Server. Um, next we move on to the uh, update on EE4J, or um, and now that we know the name, uh, Jakarta EE. Uh, that's also with Steve. And then uh, at the end, we'll give you an update on uh, Eclipse Micro Profile uh, with Mike Croft. Um, and we'll also show you some code examples as well. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to encourage you all to ask questions um, using the Q&A option. Uh, you can do it any time during the webinar and we will respond to those questions as much as time allows um, at the end of the presentations. Uh, right, so uh, let's kick off with the webinar presentations then and I'll leave you to um, Steve Milic and Mike Croft. Hi, I'll just switch over uh, to the slideshow. So, I'm Steve Millage. I'm the founder of Pyara. What I'm going to do is do two little presentations. One will basically give you an update on Pyara Server 5, uh, what our high level plans are for that, but also touch a bit on how we are sort of moving and switching the community from Pyara 4 to Pyara 5. Uh, and then I'll have an update on what Pyara are doing in Jakarta EE and EE for J and a little bit about the e for j processes. So, so Pyara 5 is due to be released very soon. Uh, we're starting to enter code free state and we're finishing off our testing. So Pyara 5 is likely to be released in the next two or three weeks, depending on how that goes, as all things with software. Uh, the, there's, a main, there's basically four main changes in uh, Pyara 5. First big change is that we are syncing up with Glassfish 5. So Pyara 5 will have in it all the EE8 reference implementations uh, for the various Java EE8 specifications in the same way as Glassfish 5 does. And this will also mean that Pyara 5 will only run on JDK 8. But it should mean that if you have Java EE 8 applications, that it should run without any problems on Pyara 5. Another major change for Pyara 5 is that we will also be synced up to be MicroProfile 1.2 compatible. Uh, we pass all the MicroProfile 1.2 TCKs, and therefore you'll be able to build and run applications on both Pyora Server 5 uh, full and Pyora Micro 5 will support the MicroProfile 1.2 APIs. So that includes uh, config API, fault tolerance, uh, health check metrics. And Mike will cover a bit more about those APIs, uh, what they can do in his part of the presentation. Uh, the final major change really in Pyora 5 is the introduction of uh, what we're calling a domain data grid. So the domain data grid is really changing how Pyora does, cl does clustering compared to say Glassfish Server. Uh, Glassfish Server uses, has the concept of a cluster uh, and it uses a technology called Shoal, which, which hasn't been developed for quite a long time. So in Pyora 4, we uh, left Shoal within Pyora, but also brought in Hazelcast as an alternative caching technology. What we've done in Pyora 5 is we've doubled down, if you like, on the usage of Hazelcast, and re we've removed the Shoal from our, uh, from our builds. Uh, 
so what, what the concept of the domain data grid really is to decouple what decouple deployment from uh, persistence and shared shared data so in, in glassfish a cluster is both a configuration and uh, a unit of data sharing for say web session data or stateful session bean data or or uh, for high availability and also it is also a deployment target so what we're doing in Priora 5 is we're splitting those concepts apart essentially out of the box all members of a domain will form a data grid and share data in memory this means it's means it's much easier to configure clustering in that clustering will will just happen uh, we built the clustering so that it's very cloud friendly so the domain data grid will be formed out of the box using even if you sort of use SSH nodes on AWS or Azure or Google or in Docker, there's no multicast involved. What happens is the cluster forms purely from the knowledge that the DAS has about which servers are a part of a domain. So it essentially talks to all the servers and discovers them and, and joins a shared in-memory data store. Uh, so they say we've tested that on many cloud providers and it works out the box without any any configuration required there are a number of configuration options in case you have something strange in your networking but in general uh, it should work out the box uh, it doesn't involve multicast so again that removes the problems on uh, cloud environments where multicast isn't supported uh, in addition to the sort of transparent forming of a data grid from the domain uh, we've also taken the concept of deployment and split that out so we've been introducing something called deployment groups which is uh, you can basically take a group of servers add them to a deployment group and use that as a target for deployment so again this is, is totally independent of uh, a config or independent of how you know data is shared across across the memory in memory data grid so instances can be in multiple deployment groups. Uh, deployment groups can have one or more instances. So it's a many-to-many -many relationship within between an instance and a deployment group. Finally, we have left the old uh, clustering in there as a deprecated uh, concept. The, the, it now uses Hazelcast rather than Shoal, but you can still use your old cluster definitions and target applications to those. As part of this as well, we've also simplified how uh, micro clusters. Uh, micro still by default will cluster using multicast uh, as it does in four, but we've introduced a couple of new cluster modes, one called uh, domain, which essentially you would give it the DAS IP and port for the DAS, and it will then cluster into the domain. Or we have uh, a mode called TCP IP, which is where you give it a list of known hosts and the micro will cluster by using, uh, trying to connect other instances of micro on that known host, set of known host addresses. And that can be used much easier in containers and on the cloud just to cluster micro standalone. So it can cluster without any multicast uh, now. So again, this is all really aimed at Giving you giving a lot of flexibility of sharing of data, of the Jcash uh, support that we provide, and to make all that work easily and seamlessly on cloud and container type environments. So that's 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 a major change that's just internal to PyR itself. So PyR itself is released in uh, multiple streams. So just to cover a little bit about how we're handling that as we move from four to five. So during 2017, uh, we have uh, four releases. So we release quarterly in the open source. That's what we call a community stream. And we do, did essentially four releases and we will do the 18-1 release of five uh, very soon. The four release went out uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, in addition to that, for customers, we provide uh, two additional streams. We have something called the feature stream, which basically takes the community product and does patch releases once a month uh, and uh, then syncs back up with the community product every three months. And then customers also have availability of the stability stream, where 
at the beginning of each year. So 17.1 was the root of the stability stream last year. Then that release stream only gets uh, bug fixes, patches, security fixes throughout the year. And customers can choose whichever release they want from the downloads. So what's happening uh, as we move from four to five is that 4.18.1 was the last uh, community stream release for the 4.x product. Uh, the next product in open source will be 5.181. And then next year, sorry, throughout this year, then we will release 5.182, 5.183, 5.184. 4.181 is the terminal release for uh, open source. For customers, uh, 4 continues, both the feature stream and the stability stream continue for customers, and 4 will continue to get features through into uh, 2019. And for 181, which came out just a couple of weeks ago, is the root of the stability stream for 2018 for the 4.x product. So in addition to that, uh, we have a standard support lifecycle for customers. So customers now also get Zulu OpenJDK support for usage with Pyora as part of their support subscription. And Pyora 4 is fully supported out through to 2019. So full support effectively is the feature stream will continue to 20, 2019, likely to be the 19.1 release or as the earliest release where that will stop. And then the stability stream for Pyro 4 will continue out into 2022. So we'll be still be doing monthly patch releases for 4.x out to 2022. And then from 2022 to 2025, we'll be doing uh, basically ad hoc security fixes, critical for bug fixes and the like. During the maintenance period, we'll do upgrades to database supports, JDK supports, and uh, operating systems and things. And aligned with that is Java 7. We, we support Pyro 4 on Java 7 into 2023 with downloads of Zulu JDK. And Java 8, we can provide support on Zulu JDK right out to 2025. We still support as a product running Pyara on other JVMs, that's, that's not changing. It's just that we can act, customers can raise actual tickets against the JDK on uh, Zulu JDK with us. Pyara 5 will be released in 2018 very soon. And that basically will have a similar sort of 10 year life cycle. Uh, it will go out of support in 2028. Uh, currently it'll be released on support on Java 8 for JDK well, JDK versions beyond that, we're really targeting the next LTS, which which we assume will be Java 11. And our aim will be to support Java 11 sometime in 2018. And we'll both provide both the JDK 8 support and the Java 11 support. So what's happening on the in GitHub is currently Pyora 5 was developed in its own branch and the master was the 4.x uh, product. As we come to Pyro 5 release, what will happen is uh, we will merge Pyro 5 into master and Pyro 4 code will be branched out into uh, its own branch as a maintenance branch. So we are an open source company. So even though we're not providing quarterly binaries for Pyora 4, all changes will go into the maintenance branch as we develop and maintain Pyora uh, you know, out to, the, to its end of life. Uh, so that you see that happen pretty soon. We're basically waiting for this webinar and to put a blog out there to explain to people what's going to happen on the branches uh, before we do that. But some of the pull requests are already queued up. Uh, we won't be producing binary builds off the four branch but their code, let's say, it'll be all open source and all the changes will be in that branch. So that's how we're basically handling the switch from uh, Pyro 4 to Pyro 5. I'll we'll go and talk a little bit around uh, what's happening in Jakarta EE or EE4J as was. EE4J is the name of the project in Eclipse. Jakarta EE will be the brand and how the messaging 
gets promoted out there and, and how, how the uh, next version will be published under that name. So, so what's that, what Oracle announced was that Java EE would be moving to the Eclipse Foundation. So what does that actually mean? Is basically all the API source code for all the uh, Java EE specifications that were run by Oracle, plus some others, uh, depending on how, whether they choose to move their code to Eclipse, will be moving to the Eclipse Foundation and it's already started. All the implementation products uh, like Glassfish, Grizzly, Mahara for JSF, Tyrus for WebSockets, all those will also be moved over to the Eclipse Foundation, along with uh, chunks of supplemental code. Uh, and one of the big, big changes will be the TCK, TCK code will also move over. So currently, uh, uh, I'm a member of the PMC and basically these projects are being moved over in batches as and when Oracle gets the repositories in a state where they uh, con you know, are cleaned up, don't contain uh, third party dependencies that, that they can't contain and various other things like that. Currently we've moved over, or Oracle's moved over, sorry, the JAXRS API, they've moved over Yazon, which is the implementation of uh, JSON binding. And they moved over all these, I won't obviously read them all out. Uh, some of them, obviously, some of the big, bigger ones like Mahara and Jersey, these projects have been created. Uh, the code will drop in there very soon. And uh, that, you know, is, again, will be another major contribution. So all the code that's going into the e for j is under that URL, github.com, Eclipse e for j each repository under there is where the code for the uh, Java e reference implementations and APIs is being placed. So once it's in Eclipse, there are a number of things that, that have to happen. So development in Eclipse, so this is my sort of personal opinion as a member of the PMC. Development in Eclipse will it basically evolve under the Eclipse development process, the EDP. And that's completely different to how things were done under the JCP. So the Eclipse Foundation uh, is very keen to do code first type development. So on the project, the committers will drive forward the project. Uh, the PMC will set some ground rules, for example, what, what branch, branches we need to maintain initially after contribution, things like that. But in general, the project itself drives forward, uh, so the committers on the project drive forward how that project evolves. Uh, it will be done uh, in open source. So it's an open source meritocracy. Committers can vote for project leads. Uh, and for committers vote for other committers based on their contributions. Importantly as well is that the TCK for these projects will also be open sourced and will develop alongside the project itself. So the way we see it is as effectively for some projects there are three three things. There's the API itself, the, 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 impl the reference implementation and then there's the TCK. And the committers will drive the development of each one of those. Parallel to that, uh, there's work in a working group, which is about brand. Uh, so the working group itself will look at brand licensing. So what, what does it mean to be Jakarta EE compatible? And what do you have to do to get that uh, brand mark and license that trademark? Uh, there is pro the basically what is the process for creating specification documents as in actual PDFs and things? And what is the overall uh, coordination and, and compliance of with the brand itself? So these two different bodies effectively the projects and the committers plus the working group will work in tandem to work out what is a platform. Obviously a lot of this is open for discussion at the moment. And uh, the working group itself hasn't been formed as a charter online already, uh, but development and under Eclipse will be heavily driven via projects. 
and coordination will be done by the PMC and working groups. Well, that's how I envisage it would happen. But like I say, a lot of the processes haven't been created yet and are open for discussion. So this is how the sort of likely roadmap I would see it would happen. So as all the source code moves, one of the first milestones is to get a Java EE compliant version of Glassfish itself, Eclipse Glassfish that is. So that will be Eclipse Glassfish certified Java EE compliant against the current TCKs as they are from Oracle. The next step will be to create a specification process whereby we can define what is Jakarta EE and then without any major changes to any of the APIs, then we would release a Jakarta EE specification and then uh, Glassfish, Eclipse Glassfish would be Jakarta EE8 compliant. Uh, and then probably not as the last milestone, but in parallel, Jakarta EE9 development will start and that will be defining how we evolve to the next version of the specification. So it, uh, currently we're just at stage one most of the source code hasn't moved yet. And once that is done, the PMC are asking projects to create a specific branch, which is to use to, to uh, achieve e Java EE8 compliance against basically the source code that's moved. And then projects are, uh, are being asked to do work in, in sandboxes and things at the moment. So the first big milestone will be that Eclipse Glassfish certified Java EE8. Uh, so Pyora Services is heavily involved in this. Uh, just a quick summary, essentially. We've got committees on the projects. Uh, I'm personally a member of the PMC. We're likely to have a couple of project leaderships for things that say, uh, Orient Teams is very involved with, like Ceteria and uh, Mahara and JSF. We've also recently joined, which we recently announced, as strategic members of the Eclipse Foundation. And what that will do is allow us to get seats on uh, the working group committees. And we're very keen to make this open source and to protect the fact that Jakarta EE will be open source. Uh, and that's how we see a lot of our role on there is to ensure that uh, open source is the way that things are done. So this is actually a huge opportunity for the community. There's a lot of uh, heat in in out there in messaging but this is a big opportunity uh the next versions of jakarta ee specifications will be developed as code first open source projects that's a major change uh, and people can get involved and be elected to be committers without and uh talking to any vendors or anything like that it'll be based on merit and contribution within the project and uh only the project itself determines who its committers are. There will be an open source TCK test suite uh, and anybody will be able to uh, contribute to that. We should increase the quality of the test suite and anybody will be able to download it and use it. There may be some rules about using branding like Jakarta EE branding. However, the test, test suites will still be there under open source. That's my understanding. Uh, so this, this basically allows to me, this makes the project or the platform to be much more open to innovation. Projects could be created which may or may not ever become part of the platform or you know, within the, under the uh, E4J overall project, but innovation can happen. And then when the innovation is ready, it could become part of the platform based on you know, how that conforms with other product, projects within that platform. This is all open for, for debate and open for grabs really. I'd like to see personally get moving into release train release train model in the same way as the actual Eclipse IDE does. So Eclipse Foundation is actually set up quite well to, to do these release train. I've no idea what the cadence of that should be, uh, but I think that would be a good idea. In the same way as MicroProfile, we basically essentially release on a periodic basis and just roll up all projects that are ready to go at that point in time. And it should open much, much broader participation. So please, please get involved for these things to happen. So that's, that's my piece. Uh, I'll hand over to Mike, who will cover Mike Profile as well, which is another good, interesting development going on at the moment. 
Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, so let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to be talking about uh, MicroProfile in Pyara. Um, I'll give a little bit of an overview of MicroProfile itself um, and then also talk about uh, how it relates to Pyara uh, with a little bit of an example uh, at the end. So I've only got a few minutes to do this. Um, I think we're running a, a little bit ahead of time, so maybe I'll be able to spend a few extra minutes on it. Um, do please use the Q&A button if you've got any uh, questions along the way, uh, and I'll try and answer them at the end. So I'm doing all this in a virtual machine, so I won't be able to see them uh, as they come up. So to start with, uh, let's talk about what's actually in uh, MicroProfile. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, uh, MicroProfile is an Eclipse project. Um, so I, I think actually um, to get almost a, a flavor of how things are going to work with Jakarta EE, uh, looking at MicroProfile is going to be quite an interesting thing to do. Obviously things will be very different. Uh, they may not follow the same kind of processes. Um, but some of the things that MicroProfile has done have been all within and governed by the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, so the fact that Jakarta EE wants to be a code first uh, development method, then uh, I think MicroProfile is a good uh, indicator of what we can expect in the future. So MicroProfile has gone through a couple of releases. Uh, 1.0 was just uh, Java EE 7 APIs, uh, which was JAXRS, JSONP, uh, and CDI. 1.1 uh, introduced uh, the top one on this list, which was the config API, the first 1.0 release. Now that was the very first API that was ever uh, written within MicroProfile. Um, and one of the driving uh, forces of MicroProfile so far is that it is a CDI first uh, specification. Uh, obviously the advantage of MicroProfile is that it doesn't have the um, historical constraints that uh, Java EE, now Jakarta EE has. Uh, so we're able to just decide that CDI was the, uh, the future and that was where we wanted to do uh, all of the uh, main work. So 1.2 was released uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. And there were, it was the, the biggest release so far actually. Uh, so there was an update to the config API, uh, it was fairly minor. Um, but what I'll do here is I'll just go through and uh, outline what each of these does. So the config API allows you to uh, develop your application with um, various different bits of configuration that will be injected at runtime. So you could uh, develop your application and deploy it into a development environment or a test environment or production, uh, and then consume uh, configuration values such as maybe a database URL uh, at runtime, maybe through environment variables or some other config source. Uh, and in Pyara, um, particularly Pyara server, we added quite a few extra config sources uh, that will be a bit more familiar to users of Pyara. So uh, the domain XML itself and the configurations that are in there or uh, the Hazelcast data grid. Uh, next were brand new APIs, so fault tolerance was brand new. Uh, and now that API is uh, it's really a specification which covers a couple of APIs, uh, all around uh, fault tolerance patterns for microservices. Um, these are fairly widely known patterns, so uh, things like circuit breaker and bulkhead. I uh, don't have time to go into all of them now, but uh, in addition to those, there are uh, annotation, CDI annotations for adding a fallback method or adding uh, retry values or timeouts uh, on different um, perhaps REST endpoints. Uh, there is a potential scope to extend this and make this work a little bit better with um, other APIs in MicroProfile, such as metrics. Uh, I'll get onto that in a moment. Next is JWT, JSON Web Token. Um, it's often pronounced uh, JOT. Uh, so uh, JOTs have become uh, quite a common way to exchange uh, encrypted uh, identities between different um, uh, microservices. Uh, so that's really uh, all around interoperability uh, in the world of microservices and cloud native development. Uh, next on to metrics. Uh, metrics so far has been developed to expose um, the current values of any different uh, component within the either server runtime or the application that you've written. Um, 
it allows you to uh, specify maybe a gauge or, or a counter or, or some kind of meter and then consume those um, through a rest endpoint uh, and that includes JMX and beans some of which have already been specified uh, and in Pyro's implementation we've got a method for you to be able to specify your own uh, and extend those a little bit. Uh, in future we may look at coordinating that with things like fault tolerance uh, so that you could maybe get metrics on how many times a particular um, annotation, so like a retry annotation or a timeout annotation has been triggered. Next we've got health check. Now health check is different to metrics in that it concerns uh, whether or not a service is up or down which is very useful for things like the docker health check which is used in uh, orchestration uh, technologies such as Kubernetes, uh, which may need to automatically fire up new instances of your microservice uh, if one of them is unhealthy. Next we've got Microhole 1.3. Now version 1.3 uh, is very new, it was just released in Q1 this year, so January time. Uh, that includes open tracing, uh, which is implemented by technologies like uh, Jaeger, uh, Zipkin, uh, it's all about being able to trace a request that comes in from the uh, boundary of your whole system and trace it through as it touches various other different uh, microservices. Uh, next, we've got Open API, which many of you may be more familiar with as uh, Swagger. Now, Swagger um, is fairly well known um, and it just allows you to define uh, a REST endpoint uh, for consumption by other people. And finally, uh, quite closely related to that, although there's, there's no overlap between those yet, is the REST client, uh, which allows you to um, consume a RESTful service in a type safe way using uh, CDI interfaces. So next, uh, we'll look at what does PyR actually implement. So, so far, uh, Steve's already been over our plans for four and five, but we have implemented MicroProfile 1.2 already in our 4.181 uh, release which is already out uh, can be used right now uh, and we've implemented it in 5.181 which is the uh, the upcoming release over the next couple of weeks and as Steve mentioned just to reiterate uh, that's currently in code freeze and testing phases uh, and also just to be very clear on this we are implementing micro profile in both Pyara server and Pyara micro so we do see that these technologies are all very useful, not just in microservices, but also in uh, cloud native deployments. And finally, uh, the new one, MicroFile 1.3, uh, it's currently scheduled for our Q2 release, 1.82, uh, which will be 5.182. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's in a very early stage yet. So we, we haven't even got 5.181 at the door. So um, that's still to be uh, confirmed. So uh, next I wanted to go over a little bit of a code example. Uh, so if I just switch over onto my other screen. Okay, let's uh, just talk through what we've got here. There's a lot on the screen. Uh, in the right hand pane, I've got our GitHub Pyara examples repository. Uh, this is what you see uh, when you first go into it. Uh, although you may not be familiar with this uh, browser extension I've got here, which allows me to browse the source in a, a nice visual way. Uh, so in the top level folder of the Pyara examples repository, we have a micro profile folder where the aim is that we will eventually have um, examples for each of the micro profile specifications that we implement. Uh, at the moment, we've just got config, uh, fault tolerance and metrics. Uh, and I'll take a little bit of a closer look at the metrics one uh, today. So you can see um, the metrics example that we've got has got a few different parts. We've got an employee resource which is a RESTful endpoint for uh, information about employees and a ticket resource, which is a RESTful endpoint to um, buy or return uh, tickets. Could be any kind of ticket, it's just really just a, an integer counter. Uh, and thirdly, the important thing is this sample Prometheus.yaml. So the metrics API was uh, designed with Prometheus uh, as a very key requirement, not because Prometheus itself is so important, although it is, it's a very key part of cloud native technology such as Kubernetes. Uh, it's a very important uh, monitoring tool in that regard. But other monitoring tools um, have taken on 
um, the style of monitoring that Prometheus does. So if you are compatible with Prometheus, it is likely that you are going to be compatible with a large number of other monitoring tools. So just have a quick look at that. We've got this uh, sample uh, configuration for Prometheus. The key lines to look at really are just these three at the bottom. So we've got the job name, microprofile metrics demo. That could be absolutely anything. It's just uh, a name for the job as it would appear in Prometheus once you collect the data. And then a target, which is just telling you what the endpoint is going to be. Um, the metrics API publishes on a REST endpoint of slash metrics uh, by default. And so that's also the default for uh, Prometheus. So we don't need to actually specify what um, HTTP URL to go for, as long as it knows the host and the uh, port number, uh, Prometheus will do the rest out of the box without any further configuration. Just a quick look at the um, uh, RESTful classes. So here we've got the employees resource class. Um, I've got an accounter here with that's annotated with at metric. This is a microprofile metrics uh, object, this counter. And this at metric just um, alerts the server to know that it needs to register this uh, in the metrics registry uh, and be monitoring it with um, the uh, change in the counter. So I, I increment that to four when I initialize uh, the class because we've got four to begin with. Uh, if I didn't do that, then it would start at zero and we'd have an incorrect counter. Similar thing with the uh, ticket resource class. This is on path tickets. Uh, again, we've got a counter with an app metric. Uh, annotation. So this will give us the count of our tickets and we've got uh, 100 tickets to sell at the start of the uh, application. Uh, now next what we've also got here is annotations on the method. Now what these annotations will do is every time the method is called uh, that will be logged uh, in the metrics registry. Uh, but you'll notice that quite commonly um, I've got two uh, methods. I've got two kinds of buy ticket. I've overloaded these. One has got a specific um, ID of a ticket that you would want to buy and the other one is just buy any kind of ticket. You don't care which one it is. Now because that would obviously conflict in the metrics registry we've got this extra value of name uh, which will allow us to tell which method is being called uh, and the numbers won't conflict with each other when they get into uh, Prometheus. So over here on the left um, in my terminal, I've cloned the Git repository, changed into the microprofile directory, and I've run maven clean install. It has built uh, the config fault tolerance and metrics projects. Um, each of these, or certainly the fault tolerance and metrics projects, uh, are using the um, Pyra micro maven plugin. So these will automatically be built into an Uber jar without any extra effort. Uh, and I can then use this command job minus jar and point at the uh, metrics 1.0 snapshot dash micro bundle dot jar. Now that is my app already packaged in with the um, uh, PyR micro runtime. So I don't need to do anything else. Uh, once I've got that running, it will look like this. Uh, and we can see here that once it started up, we've got a list of endpoints. Uh, we've got the employees endpoints and the tickets by endpoint. So this is just a, a nice little helpful um, list of endpoints that you can use just to uh, use for testing purposes. We've also got the HTTP port and the host that we're looking at. So over here, we've got my uh, Prometheus, uh, which I've literally just added the same sample Prometheus.yaml, um, renamed it to just Prometheus.yaml, uh, and then started up Prometheus and it's read that and started to consume some metrics. Uh, and here what we're going to do is look at the um, uh, buy tickets uh, endpoint. So here I've already filled in the application metric, prior examples, my profile metric, ticket resource, ticket count. And you'll see that there's this warning message here, which if I press execute, it says, oh, no data points found. The reason for that is that I haven't actually uh, called the endpoint yet. So here I've got gone to slash ticket slash buy. Now when I do load this up, it should tell me, great, I've bought ticket ID zero. Uh, and if we 
recall that a few more times we see that uh, incrementing. Now just to show you where I'm getting these um, uh, metrics from, any Pyro server, so Pyro server and Pyro micro will um, start listening on this endpoint uh, without any um, extra configuration. So it's monitorable by Prometheus right out of the box. But you can see we've got these um, uh, prefixes. So there is a base prefix, prefix which is um, a list of metrics that are uh, implemented by absolutely every microprofile uh, compatible server. So that includes uh, Liberty, Pyara, uh, Wildfly Swarm, um, wh whichever microprofile implementation it is, they will all implement the base metrics. And we can filter those just by going to slash metrics slash base. There's also uh, vendor metrics, which is specific to each implementation. Uh, at the moment, we've just got the one there, system CPU load. And finally, there's application metrics. Uh, and here we've got the list of metrics got by any ticket here. You can see that this is the override that I stated in the um, annotation, name equals by any ticket. That's already been converted to a um, endpoint. So now I've already um, added some data. I've um, bought a few tickets, let's buy a few more. Now, when I press execute, we can see that uh, Prometheus began up at the uh, 100 level and then immediately dropped down to 94. And if I zoom in a little bit more, then that's just here the um, extra few tickets that I just bought. And again, a few more. You should see that drop, drop again. So it's all quite quick, quite rapid. Uh, I've got the scrape interval down at one second, so it's collecting quite quickly. So that's all I wanted to show for metrics, um, but please do um, head over to our Pyra slash Pyra examples repository for, for more examples uh, for Pyra server and Pyra micro of the different services that we've got. Um, but all the my profile examples that we've got um, are there and we should have blogs popping up uh, to describe them uh, as time goes on. So I've, as expected, I've gone over the time that I had. So now I will uh, hand back to uh, Dominica for any uh, other questions. So thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay. Um, so let's go back to my screen. So now I think uh, we're going to cover some of the questions uh, that we've had. So yeah, thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Steve, for your presentations. Um, so the first question, um, that's probably a question to Steve. Um, so will we be able to use the built-in Hazelcast as a second level cache and query cache for Eclipse link? Okay. Uh, when Pyro 5 is released, uh, probably the answer is probably no. Uh, we have got a enhancement request that we're getting around to to get that working and to build basically integrate Hazelcast as a second level cache for Eclipse Link. It's been around for quite a while, but as we're getting more and more Hazelcast into the infrastructure of Pyara, then uh, this one will be coming up next. For example, now we have also built in Pyro 5, which didn't, which wasn't mentioned, is that the JMS timer store can be Hazelcast. So uh, I would imagine at some point in the next 12 months, we'll get around to this Eclipse link, uh, second level cache for Hazelcast as well. Okay, uh, next question. Um, that's either for, for Mike or Steve. So um, in regards to MicroProfile and Jakarta EE, are there any plans to have a data API similar to Spring Data? I'll, I'll pick it up initially. Uh, so that's a very interesting question. And uh, it's really about the process of both MicroProfile and uh, Jakarta EE. Given both these projects are now top level open source projects, uh, really to, ha to make that happen, all that should need to happen is that you get some people together uh, you start some work on shaping what that looks like in, in code. And then you ask either MicroProfile or E4J 
for a repository where you can continue doing that sort of development. Uh, that's how it works in MicroProfile, and that's the sort of way I'd expect it to work within Jakarta EE. Uh, once you have that repository, then it will basically be code first development. You would start working out with, with others how, how that API would look, building uh, you know, reference implementation, defining the API, building a test suite. And then once that's ready to go, like I mentioned, having a release train similar to MicroProfile, once that's ready to go, then it would be rolled up into uh, a MicroProfile or a Jakarta EE release. So there's no need to wait for some you know, grand top level body or do a, a you know, a, a JSR request before you can start working on something that in the new world of Jakarta EE or Mike profile. I don't know if Mike has any comments on that. Uh, not particularly. I think you've uh, covered everything quite well there. Okay. So the next question, uh, in the near future, do you have planned to develop the Eclipse adapter or plugin for Payara 5 as it's very important for the server adoption. Okay, uh, so I mentioned this on the chat. So we are doing quite a lot on ID and development uh, tooling. So what we've done is done in sort of order of what we think we thought was a priority. First, we built Maven connectors for Pyara Micro and Pyara Server. Next, we built uh, just recently released an Archillion connector, both for Micro and Server, and that will come out with five. Uh, we've also did a NetBeans update to NetBeans plugin. So there's, there's quite a big discussion at the moment on the EEPJ community list about Eclipse support. So there is actually a plugin that works, it's, which is done by Oracle, which is Eclipse. Uh, I think it's called Glassfish Tools, but I, I might be wrong on the naming. And that has been sort of muted in mailing lists that, they, that may move over to the Eclipse Foundation. If that does, we will... Uh, work on that and provide engineer resource to you know get that up to scratch if, if there's a problem with it at the moment if that doesn't move over then we'll definitely look at making standalone plugins for for eclipse as well okay and one more question from chat which uh, might be worth answering live as well so everyone can uh, see so um can you tell us a bit more about cluster configuration in version 5 uh, will it be possible to forget JMS to synchronize beans in the cluster? Uh, will it be automatically shared or synchronized? Okay, so one of the very, very, very last pull requests that went into Pyro 5 before well, code freeze was the capability to have a clustered singleton. So this will be, I think, I, um, I might be wrong here because I didn't write it, but I think it covers both EJB and CDI you will be able to have a single CDI bean that state is st saved within the cluster. So you will be able to get rid of JMS to do that sort of thing. Uh, we do have already in Power4 lightweight clustered messaging called the clustered event bus. And so you wouldn't have to do JMS in Power4 either to do synchronization. You could use the event, CDI event bus to do that. And what, what the CDI event bus does is allows you to annotate a CDI event as outbound. And what that does is it then broadcasts it throughout the cluster and then you your event listener and CDI can be annotated inbound and then when an outbound event is broadcast anywhere in the cluster that inbound event handler would be called. Uh, that can be used to replace JMS for that sort of thing as well. But we do have uh, dedicated functionality coming in Pyro 5 to do this, to do a clustered singleton. Okay, thanks, Steve. So um, one more, which is probably more of a suggestion than a question, and I could probably uh, answer that. Uh, so um, it would be great to have a comparison between MicroProfile and Spring Boot. Yes, so uh, I can uh, potentially take that back to the MicroProfile uh, marketing team, uh, which uh, I'm a member of. So we can discuss whether whether we can. Um, create a sort of document uh, with a comparison and maybe um, some sort of a, a technical demo may follow. So I will definitely take it back to the, uh, to the marketing um, group uh, as a suggestion. So thanks for that. Um, right, and uh, just there was another question on the, um, on the chat, uh, which is more marketing related. 
about um, spreading the word about Jakarta EE. Uh, so as some of you might be aware, um, after the, the name was uh, announced last week, um, the, at the moment the Eclipse Foundation uh, and its members, including Payara, are um, basically working on uh, development of the branding. So that's, that's all ongoing. So once uh, this is all done, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, there will be a short list of uh, logos and branding for the community to choose from potentially. Uh, so uh, after that, we will definitely be focusing with the marketing team uh, with Eclipse, we'll be focusing on um, promoting Jakarta EE as well. So that's definitely going to happen, but we're probably looking at kicking that off uh, in the next couple of months uh, once the branding is actually ready. So that's that's as much as I can tell at, at this early stage. Um, yeah, so I think that's all questions we've had. Um, yes. So unless you've got, unless anybody's got any more questions, then uh, I guess um, we will be finishing. So thank you very much again to Steve and Mike, and thanks uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, here are some of the links, useful links uh, to the uh, obviously Payara website, micro profile project, and the EE4J projects uh, on the Eclipse website. And be on the webinar. If you've got any more questions, uh, feel free to email them to uh, info at payara.fish. Uh, you can also uh, reach out to Steve and Mike on Twitter. So these are the Twitter handles. Um, yeah, so thanks again for joining us and uh, feel free to get back in touch uh, if needed. And thank you and goodbye. Thanks. Thank you.